Today on Blue 58, it is a new year, and what do you do on the first day of a new year? You make some resolutions. We've got a few for Packers General Manager Brian Gutekunst. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast to the powersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink, and a happy new year to you. Hope 2020 brings you a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff in store at the Power Sweep in Blue 58 in 2020. We're going to talk about that a little later on in this episode, but I want to talk about some actual Packers-related stuff first and foremost. First, we've got to talk seeding. We concluded the last episode by talking about a few of the possibilities for the Packers in terms of where they could end up. Because when we recorded, there were still a couple games that could affect both where the Packers would end up and who they could be playing in the divisional round of the playoffs. Well, the Seahawks couldn't quite get it done against the San Francisco 49ers, and that means the Packers are the two seed. That's okay. They still get a bye. We knew that was going to be the case, though, because they beat the Lions, securing the bye, blah, blah, blah. You know the story. But... We also know the rest of the field, which means we know who the Packers could play in the divisional round. And that means uh, there's really just one game you have to watch to determine who the Packers are going to get. First, and that game is the 3-6 matchup for the Saints and Vikings. Now, obviously, the, the other game is not decided as a result of this game, but this one tells us, uh, narrows the field more than more than anyone else. If the Saints win this game, the Packers automatically play against the Saints. They get the highest seeded team that comes through uh, in in the playoffs or in the in the wild card round. And, and then the winner of the, the Eagles-Seahawks game would go on to play the 49ers. If the Saints would lose, the Vikings would travel to San Francisco to play the 49ers, and then the Packers would get the winner of the Eagles and Seahawks game. I don't know if I really have a preference who the Packers play. I think there are enough mitigating circumstances to to feel good, honestly. And I, I honestly believe that to feel good about whoever the Packers play. The Saints are a powerful team, but they have been wildly inconsistent this year. They've been almost as inconsistent as the Packers. They've, they've dropped some really, really winnable games. So have the Packers, but um, I think that just that works in the Packers' favor. And getting the, the, the Saints on the road plays to the Packers' advantage, too. The Eagles and Seahawks, again, all uh, also flawed teams. And, and that's really the theme of the entire NFC playoff field. I think they're flawed teams top to bottom. One through six, everybody's got some serious flaws, and it, there's really no outstanding juggernaut. If you had to pick one from the field, for me, it's probably the 49ers. But then again, it could just as easily be the Seahawks. Eagles could get hot. Anybody can make a run. And that's why it's the most important thing to just get into the playoffs. And that's what the Packers have done. They've also put themselves one step into the playoffs already, one round in uh, with with that bye week. They're 120 minutes from the Super Bowl. Yep, they're a flawed team. This is not the greatest Packers playoff team in, in, the, in the last decade. So what? They're in. They can get hot. They can get to the Super Bowl. Anything can happen once you're in the postseason. I thought we would take some of this episode, since we're a ways out from the Packers' next playoff game, to look a little bit further down the road. And as I mentioned up top, since it is the first of the year, that means making a few New Year's resolutions. I've got four here that I think Brian Gutekunst should consider. I've kind of centered on Gutekunst because I think of everybody in the Packers organization who is going to play a big role on this team in 2020. He is the one who can move the needle the most. So we've talked about the the top end of the Packers power structure as being uh, Mark Murphy, Brian Gutekunst, and Matt LaFleur. Uh, behind him, you've got Aaron Rodgers and Mike Pettin kind of on their own tier, and then everybody else other than that. Mark Murphy, there's not a whole lot he's going to do this offseason that's going to affect the Packers in 2020, unless he would, for some reason, fire Brian Gutekunst or, or Matt LaFleur. He's just not going to have a very influential offseason, and that's probably a good thing. You don't want the president of your football organization having to make regular significant decisions about what happens on the field. So that's a good thing. Mark Murphy's probably out of the picture. Same thing more or less for Matt LaFleur. He's going to have largely the same responsibilities in 2020 that he did in 2019. The only person who's really making significant changes for the Packers between now and the next time they're on the field or the next time they play a regular season game, I guess, is going to be Brian Gutekunst. So I have a few resolutions for him to make. First and foremost, cut some dead wood from the roster. Every team has guys that are just not fitting in anymore, and they have opportunities to 
to move on from those guys and clear up some space on the roster and on their salary cap sheet. And the Packers have some of those guys. Uh, Jimmy Graham and Lane Taylor are the names that really jump out. I throw Ryan Grant in there too because nobody even really knows why he's on the team. I mean, he's not, it's not a big multi year contract here, but just move on. Just figure out why you had him on the roster in the first place. That's a story, I guess, for a different day. But cutting Jimmy Graham and Lane Taylor feels up, frees up a little over, I think, 12 million on my last ca- ca- calculations in cap space. It's a significant amount of money. There will be some dead cap with both of them, but not a significant amount. Just moving on from those guys gives you flexibility to do some other things going forward. Graham just has not worked out as a free agent signing for Brian Gutekunst. That was always a possibility, and that's that's what ended up happening here. Wish it was otherwise, but, but it is not, and uh, I think it's time to just move on. Lane Taylor is a long, long-term success story for the Green Bay Packers, but I think the time has come to move in a different direction. There is no starting role for him in Green Bay anymore, and it looks like he's too expensive to really justify keeping him around as a backup. Couple that with the extension of Lucas Patrick, the just amount of roster spots available for potential backup guards is pretty slim. You have to think the Packers at least have some interest in keeping Cole Madison around, considering he's going to be significantly cheaper than Lane Taylor. I just have a hard time finding a spot for him on the 2020 Packers. This is pruning. This is not remaking your roster. This is eliminating parts of your roster that are not performing at the highest possible level just because it's going to help your entire, well, if you want to continue with the analogy, plant grow stronger. You cut off some parts of the plant that might seem counterintuitive, but it does help your overall product get a little bit stronger. You also want to avoid sunk costs, the idea of uh, keeping a guy around just because you've spent a lot of money on him already. I think that's true in the in the case of both Jimmy Graham and Lane Taylor, that that could be a temptation there. You can't fall victim to that. You can't say, I'm going to keep these guys around just because I've spent a lot of money or devoted a lot of time to developing them. That is not something that you want to do that's going to be detrimental to the overall health of your football team. So first resolution for Brian Gutekunst to resolve to cut some roster dead wood. Second, resolve to extend Kenny Clark just so everybody can stop talking about signing Kenny Clark to an extension. Look, I get it, everybody. Kenny Clark is good, and Kenny Clark's contract needs to be extended. Do you really think the Packers are going to just let Kenny Clark walk out the door? No, of course not. So Brian Gutekunst needs to just resolve to get a deal done so everyone can stop talking about it. Yeah, it's it's a story just until it happens, but it's going to happen. Kenny Clark is going to get extended, get it done, just so we can all move on and stop talking about it. That's a pretty simple resolution. They want Kenny Clark around. Kenny Clark probably wants to be in Green Bay, uh, assuming there's not something we don't know about behind the scenes there. Seems like everyone should be agreeable to this. He's a great player. Keep him around. Third resolution, though, he should resolve to break a few unwritten roster rules. So the Packers, by and large, long term, have been known as a draft and develop sort of team. You draft guys, you keep them around, you develop them from within, and and then once, once they get to the point where they are the player they're going to become, you keep them around. In the case of Blake Martinez, I think it's time to break that roster rule. I've been on the anti-Blake Martinez train for a while. I don't want to overplay that hand because I still think he seems like a pretty good guy and a pretty decent football player, but I think you can do better too. And the cost to extend him is, uh, is probably going to be prohibitive given the sort of player that he is. I think in a former era of Packers football, it would have been close to a no-brainer to expect him to stick around. I don't think that's the reality the Packers live in anymore, and I think they need to move on. Kind of the flip side of that, though, is uh, is the case of Brian Bulaga. I think the Packers should re-sign him. I think it's worth a roll of the dice, given the quality of player that he is, to try to bring him back for another tour with the Packers. Yep, he's well over 30 now. Yep, there are some injury concerns in his past. But when he is on the field, is he not one of the elite pass blockers in the NFL? I think it's pretty clear that he is. If you can get him on the field for even 12 games in 2020, I think that's worth bringing him back. It just stabilizes that much of your offensive line. It's Sure, it'll be uh, more costly than bringing in a rookie or a a lower-end free agent, but he's going to be a much better quality player, and that just gives you another year to find a suitable replacement for him when he eventually does have to move on. Finally, uh, looking a little bit more to the future, I think there are are some 
other rules that Gudikunst might want to consider breaking. These may not these may seem a little counterintuitive. Let's start with the one that probably seems the most understandable after week 17. First, he should solidify a plan at quarterback. I don't know if this is the year to draft a quarterback. I am skeptical of the idea of the draft and develop idea uh, situation with a quarterback anymore, given how much, given the advantage of having a guy in a rookie deal. I don't know really what the point is of drafting a guy high and then sitting him. The real advantage to having a, a rookie quarterback is getting him in the first round and having five cheap years of a rookie quarterback deal. I don't think the Packers need to spend a first round pick on the, on a quarterback. I don't think that serves the overall interests of their team now or in the relatively near future. But they do need to think about what exactly they need to do. And Brian Gunnikins should go into this offseason with eyes wide open. Should an Aaron Rodgers situation develop in the draft, somebody falls to them, that is something he should be thinking about now, whether he'd be comfortable drafting a guy or not and I'm sure he has but I my point is there needs to be a plan in place for Aaron Rodgers he's going to be going into his age 37 season next year the real decline is drawing ever closer no matter what you think about his 2019 season sooner or later Aaron Rodgers is going to decline for real and for good and you need to have a plan in place for when that happens maybe that plan is to just ride it out until the absolute bitter end I think that's a legitimate approach here. Say we're not going to devote any resources to quarterback until we absolutely positively have to, and then we'll do whatever it takes to get our next quarterback. I think that's a a justifiable approach if you're wanting to maximize the window with the guy that you have now. Whatever that plan ultimately is, I think by March, the Packers should feel confident in, in what they're going to do with quarterback this year next year and probably the year after that because then you're starting to talk like age 39 age 40 season for Aaron Rodgers and who knows what could happen by then finally under this third break some unwritten roster rules resolution I think Brian Gutekunst needs to draft a running back this spring Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams are both going to be heading into contract years and there is a good chance that you're not going to keep either of them for sure it's going to be only one and it's going to be Aaron Jones if you're deciding between those two It's a non-zero possibility, and I just floated it there, that neither of them ultimately return to Green Bay. And you need to keep stocking that position because it's a high turnover position anyway. It's kind of a minor miracle that two of them are still with the Packers. The Packers drafted three that year. Don't forget about Devontae Mays. I think it's fairly unusual, somewhat remarkable, that they even got two of those three guys to stick heading into what's going to be their fourth year. Running back, again, is a relatively high turnover position, and the Packers need to inject, continue to inject more talent into that that group. I know Dexter Williams is still kicking around. If the Packers felt good about him on the roster, I think they, they probably would have played him more by this point. It wouldn't be Tyler Irvin getting reps in a meaningful football game ahead of him. I am not sold at all on Dexter Williams, and I think it'd be surprising if the Packers were. So I think as a result, they need to inject some more talent into the running back position. Don't be afraid to burn a draft pick on a back this year. Finally, my fourth resolution for for Brian Gutekunst this offseason is to take two big swings at a wide receiver between now and the start of the next season. I think there are three options out there, obviously. There are three options out there. There are three ways that you can acquire a player. You can trade for a guy, you can spend a draft pick on a guy, or you can sign a free agent. I think Brian Gutekunst needs to swing big in at least two of those three areas. He could trade for a high-profile wide receiver. Perhaps you've followed some of the stuff that's developed in Cleveland over the past couple days. There is some organizational turmoil there. And if you would like to pry a certain big-name wide receiver out of that situation, it would seem like now is the time to make your offers. Who knows what could happen? Uh, It's the old GM heat check situation that I've talked about in the past. If you consider yourself a good general manager, better than some other general managers, you should be calling those other general managers, uh, offering them deals just to see what is going to work out. The Packers should be be calling on Odell Beckham Jr. at the very least. You should see what's out there. I'm not saying doing a deal is the right call or the best call, but you at least owe it to yourself and your team to see what the going price is because he could be a difference maker if you have the opportunity to acquire him. 
Trading for a receiver is an option. Odell Beckham Jr., just, a, just an example there. Then you're going to have some opportunities in free agency. A name I've been watching over the past uh, six, seven weeks or so is Sammy Watkins in Kansas City. Ever since the Packers played the Chiefs, uh, and I got a little bit familiar with their wide receiver depth chart, his name has kind of been in the back of my mind. He has a huge cap number there next year. He is clearly the third option there in Kansas City between Tyreek Hill, behind Tyreek Hill, and Travis Kelsey at tight end. It's it's a lot of money to put out uh, for a guy who is not at the top of his depth chart or your depth chart or whatever terminology you want to use there. It's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the Chiefs do there, and it wouldn't be a surprise at all to see him become a free agent. And if you're looking for a complimentary number two, number two, uh, 1A sort of receiver, that could be an option. He's a different skill set than Alan Lazard or any of the other receivers on the roster right now because while he is a, a good deep threat, he has, has some deep speed, he's probably a better route runner than anybody on the Packers right now other than than Devontae Adams just by virtue of having been in the NFL for as long as he has been. That's a potential option there. And again, not the only option, but a potential option out there. Finally, you could burn a high draft pick at wide receiver. And I think this is probably the most likely outcome here, given what we see in this wide receiver class coming up. It's, it seems like an almost certainty that the Packers are going to have good options available in the first or second round at wide receiver. And they might as well throw a draft pick at one of those options there. Either way, anyway, whatever the Packers do, I think Gutekunst owes it to his, his overall offensive picture, to himself as a roster constructor, to take two of these three options, take swings at two of these three options and try to build out that receiving core a little bit more. Alan Lazard has come along nicely this season and that's been fun to watch, but they still could use more talent at wide receiver and tight end too for that matter. But just restricting restricting it to wide receiver, I think the Packers need to take some big swings and they need to explore those three talent acquisition options uh, pretty thoroughly if if that's what they decide to do. Let's look ahead a little bit more personally for 2020. What can you expect from the power sweep and from Blue 58 in 2020? I've been spending the last couple of days going over what I want to accomplish and what uh, what I think serves the audience best uh, in 2020. First and foremost, again, and I know I, I said this last week, uh, I very much appreciate everybody who's downloaded and, and clicked on our, our stuff in 2019. It was a tumultuous year for me personally. A lot of stuff going on, new jobs, old jobs, uh, the arrival of a new family member. We did everything pretty much short of uh, of having significant, uh, this sounds morbid, but like a significant death in the family or moving across states again. Um, it, it was a wild year, and I appreciate everybody who was along for the ride with us. But looking ahead to 2020 with a little bit more stability here, I think there are some great things that we can accomplish and uh, some great ways that we can serve your Packers content needs going forward into 2020. So first, what I think you should expect from from the, the Power Sweep and Blue 58 in, in 2020 is some more consistent content. Uh, just because of the way 2019 shook out, I did not get to do as much writing as I, I would have liked in 2019. But I'm committing to uh, at least two articles, two written articles of, uh, you know, substantial written articles uh, for the power sweep per month in 2020. That gets us out to 24 per month. That may not sound like a lot, but it's it's one every other week, at, uh, give or take. And I think it will add a little bit of flavor to the, the podcast stuff that we do. I'm also going to continue with, with the podcast pretty much as it is. Uh, here in the relatively near future, after the Packers are ultimately either eliminated from the playoffs or win the Super Bowl, we're going to continue with the three times per week schedule because I think that works best with the, with the sort of flow of, uh, of the games and, and the weeks and stuff like that. But once we head into the offseason, we are going to drop down to two times per week like we did last year. I think that's just the best for me as an, an actual person. And I think we run the risk if we try to stick at three times per week of, of watering down the content. And I'm always cognizant of that. I don't want to want to give you weak shows just because we're trying to get to a certain number. So I think two times per week is is going to be good through the the off season and then we'll sort of reassess once we get closer to the regular season but that gets you up to 104 podcasts per year or per for 2020 and then for our patreon listeners i would like to be more consistent with that content as well we explored some stuff last year and that kind of fell off uh, due to due to some life stuff but i would like to continue to reward the people who are are generous enough to support us on patreon with some content and i'm committing to doing one at least 
uh, piece of Patreon exclusive con- content per month in 2020. Uh, so just, just to review there, that's, uh, two pieces of written content a month, two podcasts a week at least, and then one Patreon piece per month. There is more stuff coming though, because I've got some new stuff in the works for 2020 as well. First and foremost, and I've teased this uh, a couple times in the past, but I am getting further along in a new podcast project that I, I think will be of interest to you if you, you've followed any of the stuff that we've done with Packers history in the past. That's about all that I feel comfortable saying right now, but it is going to be history focused and a new podcast coming for you in 2020. This is going to be a standalone thing from Blue 58 just because of, you know, how production works and stuff like that. I think it's best to do it that way and, uh, it'll be able to, but it'll stand alone on its own. Um, in terms of podcast feeds and stuff like that. But uh, I am committing to getting that out in 2020, and there will be more information about that as uh, as release time comes closer. Don't have a target date on that yet, but I, I'm excited to at least announce in a very, very early form a new podcast for you in 2020. I also have a couple ebooks in the works. We, we've done a couple of those in the past. One of them is going to be, well, we've done one of them in the past, which you should check out. You can find it if you search uh, Following Favre on Amazon. Uh, it's, it, it's available on your Kindle or however you read your ebooks. Um, check that out. But I, I have an, another couple ebooks in the works that I think are going to be of interest to you. So keep an eye out for those. Um, and uh, I will have more details on those as the, the time draws a little bit closer. Finally, uh, I am also in the process of writing what I think is going to de- develop into an e-learning course uh, that's going to be podcast specific. And again, I can't get super specific. Don't want to give away all the details just yet on, on what it's going to be. But that's going to come out at some point in 2020 as well if everything goes according to plan. Uh, but at the very least, I want to commit to those the, those numbers that I talked about with the, with the podcast, with the written stuff, uh, with the Patreon, um, and then the, then the bonus stuff on top of that should bring us out, um, to some, some good content numbers. And that's really what I want to stay on top of getting consistent content, getting co- podcasts and written content in front of you, the audience who have been so loyal to us over these years. Now our fourth year coming to a close, uh, at the power sweep which is very, very exciting. 16, 17, 18, and now 19. What a, what a time in Packers history we've been able to cover um, here at Blue 58 and at the Power Sweep. It's been a lot of fun. So to sum up, here are the numbers that I would like to, to hit at the very least. These are baseline numbers uh, for four pieces of content that will be headed your way in 2020. Two podcasts a week at the very least. That brings us uh, to 104 episodes, uh, 24 posts at thepowersweep.com, 12 pieces of content on Patreon, uh, a new podcast that's going to be at least seven episodes if things go according to plan there, uh, two new ebooks, and one e-learning course that brings us out to an even 150 pieces of content. I think that's an ambitious schedule, but also an, an achievable one. And I'm excited to bring you those things in 2020 and beyond. Uh, I'm very excited about that, and I hope that you will continue to support us as you have so generously over these past four years with the Power Sweep. If you would like to support us, the best way that you can do that is by leaving a rating and review on whatever podcast listening app that you use. That does help more people find the show. You can, of course, choose to support us on Patreon. Uh, that brings, uh, well, it helps us continue to to do the things that we do. It offsets our hosting costs and uh, could allow for some studio upgrades in 2020. That's another thing that I'm working on as well, and I, I anticipate that will come to fruition too. Uh, so patreon.com slash the power sweep. If you want to see that content that's coming your way in, in 2020, uh, I would recommend it. I think there's going to be some fun stuff there. I've got some cool ideas, and I think, uh, think you will enjoy it. Or if you don't want to do either of those things, you can just reach out. Say hi on, on Facebook, on Twitter, via email. Ask us a question. Just stop by and say hello. Uh, that furthers the conversation around the Packers, gives me some stuff to react to uh, that uh, inter- intersects directly with the things that you're thinking about, which just furthers the conversation around this great team that we we cover and enjoy watching. And I think that that just helps all of us become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We will see you next time on Blue 58.